Good morning to you. We're glad to have you here this week. So this morning, we are going to be reading out of Colossians. And I'm going to read it to you twice. Um, first, I'm going to read it to you in the NRSV. And then I'm going to read it to you in the message. So a little explanation, I guess. NRSV, New Revised Standard Version, that's the, the translation that I generally prefer, although there's a number of translations that you can use. The message is not a direct translation. The message is an interpretation. So it takes what's directly said and it uses the language to get to the meaning of it all. So a direct translation would be, when he reached his old age, he slept with his ancestors. Well, you have to understand that when it says he slept with his ancestors, they mean he died. An interpretation would say, he got old and died. Means the same thing, but it's not actually the direct words that they used. So we're going to be reading in Colossians chapter 2, beginning of verse 20. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the universe, why do you live as if you still belong to the world? Why do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. All these regulations refer to things that perish with use. They are simply human commands and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-imposed piety, humility, and severe treatment of the body, but they are of no value in checking self-indulgence. Okay, so that's okay, but I really, really, really like the way the message puts it. If you go back a little further in chapter 2, it begins with this sentence, which I really like. And I want you to think about this. Kind of hold it with you as we go through. You received Christ Jesus, the Master. Now live him. Think about that. You received Jesus. Now live him. So I'm going to read a little more of this, this part in, in the message version. Entering into this fullness is not something you figure out or achieve. It's not a matter of being circumcised or keeping a long list of laws. No, you're already in. Insiders. Not through some secret rite of initiation, but rather through what Christ has already gone through for you, destroying the power of sin. If it's an initiation ritual you're after, you've already been through it by submitting to baptism. Going under the water was a burial of your old life. Coming up out of it was a resurrection. God raising you from the dead as he did Christ. When you were stuck in your old sin-dead life, you were incapable of responding to God. God brought you alive right along with Christ. Think about it. All sins forgiven. The slate wiped clean. That old arrest warrant canceled and nailed to Christ's cross. He stripped all the spiritual tyrants in the universe of their sham authority at the cross and marched them naked through the streets. So don't put up with anyone pressuring you in details of diet, worship services, or holy days. All those things are mere shadows cast before what was to come. The substance is Christ. Don't tolerate people who try to run your life, ordering you to bow and scrape, insisting that you join their obsession with angels and that you seek out visions. They are a lot of hot air. That's all they are. They're completely out of touch with the source of life, Christ, who puts us together in one piece, whose very breath and blood flow through us. He is the head and we are the body. We can grow up healthy in God only as he nourishes us. So then, if with Christ you've put all those pretentious and infantile put all that pretentious and infantile religion behind you. I'll say that again. In Christ, you've put all that pretentious and infantile religion behind you. Why do you let yourselves be bullied by it? Don't touch this. Don't taste that. Don't go near this. Do you think things that are here today and gone tomorrow are worth that kind of attention? Such things sound impressive, if said in a deep enough voice. 
They even give the illusion of being pious and humble and ascetic. But they are just another way of showing off, making yourselves look important. Religion. Huh. Let's talk a little about religion. Does it set us free? Or does it put us in chains? Well, kind of depends on what you think religion is and how you treat religion and what you think the main point of religion is. Is your religion grace-based? Is it about forgiveness and freedom in Christ? Or is your religion performance-based? Is it about the law and keeping the rules? Now we think there have to be rules, right? There's got to be rules. We need to know what the rules are so that way we can know whether or not we're meeting the rules to understand whether or not we are good, whether or not we've met our expectations. If we don't have that list to check off, then how do we know that we're okay? We look at the Ten Commandments. We talked about that in an earlier sermon series about how we take these Ten Commandments and we turn them into a list of rules. And really, they were called the Ten Words. And the Ten Words were designed not as a burden on us, but as a way for us to understand what it means to love God and to love neighbor. The Ten Words were all about how do you live as humans in a society where you put love of God first and love of neighbor second. And yet we've twisted it into a checklist to keep everybody in, you know, we got to order people up. you got to know if you're coming in at the top or if you're coming in at the bottom. But in John 13, 34, Jesus says this, A new commandment I give you, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. When Jesus was questioned, what is the greatest commandment? He answers, none of the ten. He answers, love God, love others. There's your greatest commandment. But we take these, these commandments, these rules, this list that we use to check off, and we turn it into something distorted. Distorted. Our religion becomes distorted. When we look at it through that eye of legalism, where it's all about the laws, and it's not about grace, it distorts who we are, it distorts how we see the world, it just messes things up. And I'll tell you what, Jesus doesn't handle that real well. When we begin to look at the world through laws instead of grace, when he was talking to the Pharisees, he's, he told them, he was laying it out. This is what happens when you let the rules take over and don't live into that commandment of love God, love others. This is in Matthew 23, beginning in verse 23. Now he's talking to the scribes and Pharisees, and we want to make the scribes and Pharisees the bad guys. And, and the way Jesus talks about them, they do kind of look like the bad guys. They're the religious guys, though. That's who they are. The religious guys. And Jesus sees them working that religion into rules that hold people down. Rules that cut people out. And it irritates him. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you tithe mint, dill, and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law. Justice and mercy and faith. It is these you ought to have practiced without neglecting the others. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat, but swallow a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you clean the outside of the cup and of the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup so that the outside also may become clean. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside look beautiful, but inside they are full of the bones of the dead and all kinds of filth. So you also, on the outside, look righteous to others, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. 
they were so bound up in the rules that they forgot the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, love. We get bound up in those rules. We get caught up in religion. And sometimes the religion we get caught up is in is religion for religion's sake. What? We don't need to be doing religion for religion's sake. And in fact, we don't even really need to be doing religion for God's sake. God is fully complete and whole and fine. God doesn't need us to become whole. God is whole. But God wants us. God wants us in relationship with God. That's what God would desire from us, is that we be in that relationship with God. There is a point to this religion that we practice, but it's not the religion itself that is the point. It is this relationship that we have with God that creates in us that desire to love God and to love others. But when we go back to that rule-based religion, that's us saying that we're doing the right things with a really deep voice so that we look pious and humble, but really all we're doing is showing off and making ourselves look important. But you know, it's kind of funny how God works in that. Because, you know, just about the time you think you've got it all together, God's going to come and knock you down a peg or two. For me and for a lot of people, it happened when we went to seminary. <laughs> you go to seminary. Here you got this, this call from God. You stand there and you think, whoo, this, this is just amazing. And you get into the classes and all of a sudden you realize that they're telling you it's not about you. It's just not about you. I can remember the first time it happened, somebody got knocked off his peg, and it was because we're sitting in a class, and the pastor, um, the, pre the teacher is talking and asking about favorite verses, and one guy said, well, I, you know, I've guided my life on that passage in Micah that says, I know what plans I have for you, plans for your good and not your harm, to prosper you. <laughs> the professor looked at him and said, that's great. Of course, he was talking to Mike and not you. What? It's not about you. It's not about you. Turning to live into that idea that this is about God. All of this is about God. Not about me or what I bring to it or what I want even. This is about God. So when we read that piece earlier in Colossians where it said we need to live Christ, live Christ. Paul says it again in another way, it is not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So we stand here and we realize, okay, okay, I need to live Christ. I, I don't know about you, but I actually, I want to live Christ. I want to live Christ. How do I do it? So the next thing we want to say is, give me the rules so I know how. Uh, that's a problem, isn't it? Because then we're back to legalism. Give me the rules so I know how to live Christ. But it's not that easy, really. In fact, it's infinitely harder than that infinitely harder than that because we have to live into this idea of love God and love others allowing Christ to live within us the Holy Spirit to work through us and to interpret what is God calling me to in this time and in this place and it is not nearly as easy as if you give me a list of rules that I can follow we have to figure out how do we live as people in the world? How do we live as people in the church, staying true to that calling that God has given us without the list of the rules? And the answer to that is we love. We love. 
That's the bottom line. We love. And if we answer that correctly, we love as Christ has loved us. That's the standard he gave. Love one another as I have loved you. So then the rules are not nearly as necessary because you understand that you can't kill your neighbor or rob from your neighbor or hurt your neighbor because that is not loving them as Christ has loved you. So you get back to the rules, except you come back to them through grace and love instead of setting that list of rules as the marker that cuts people out. Because too often, I think that's what we're doing. We're telling people out there, you know, I really do love you. I just think you're a really awful person. Well, I'm going to be here to tell you that that's not loving. (laughs) When you say, I really do love you, but I think you're an awful person, you are not being loving. We have to meet them where they are and show them who they are and proclaim to them what God has done and who God has named and claimed them to be. And when they can see that, when they can see that, they can understand what it means to live out of love, to love one another as I have loved you. But these are hard places. This, it's really hard when you get caught between the law and love and figuring out where that line stands. And we live it, we live it now. We see children taken from their families and then we're stuck between law and love. And how do we live it out? We see the criminalization of addiction and we stand there and we're stuck between law and love. And how do we live that out? There are those places where the law and love fight each other. And we want it to be easy. We like easy answers. We want somebody to just tell us what the right answer is. But it it tends to not come that easily. I think that's why it's so easy for us to become the Pharisee. We want an easy answer. We want the list. And we can become comfortable in that list in those answers, the easy answers, instead of getting stuck in the messiness of the world where we're stuck fighting between law and love. But the world is messy. The world is uncomfortable. It is uncomfortable. And yet we stand here as a church and say, come on world, come on in. Bring all that messiness, that ugliness, that dysfunction, all those problems, bring them in here. Bring them in here. I think, I'm afraid that what we want them to do is to come in here and be like us. But that's not what we want. Bring it in here. Bring your messiness. Bring the things that you have that make me uncomfortable. Because it's time for me to find comfort in that discomfort. It's time for me as a follower of Jesus Christ to understand that I need to be part of this world and part of the witness in the world. And to do that, I have to stand next to the one who makes me uncomfortable. And I got to get used to it. I just got to get used to it. When we pay attention to our love of God and love of neighbor, and truly live it out, we are going to find ourselves in uncomfortable places. And that's okay. I think Jesus walked it all the time. Luckily for us, Jesus was so comfortable with people and their stuff that he walked right into the tombs and called to the mentally ill. (laughs) That he walked right into dinner and sat down with those who were sinners that he skipped the ritual when he sat down to eat because he was okay with being uncomfortable. He was okay with that. In fact, he was good with that because he loved. He loved everyone he met. 
He loved them enough to sit with them, even when they made him uncomfortable. So we have to kind of walk both those paths as we navigate this thing we call religion. Because all too often religion can become a thing on its own that we worship instead of God. We have to attend to our love of God. And that is the stuff that we take for religion. It's coming to worship. It's being in community. It's reading our Bible. It's praying. It's doing all of those things. That is us attending to our love of God. But we also have to attend to our love of neighbor. To fully live into the commandment he gives us, we have to do that as well. And we don't get to define neighbor. It is the one who makes us uncomfortable. It is. So I would suggest that we as believers need to start our day in the comfortable. Start your day in prayer, in devotion, reading the Bible, attending to those things that fill you up. As Jerry puts it, we do the smile, stretch, and put on Jesus. We set ourselves in the knowledge of who we are and whose we are, and we fill our soul. We do that, though, not as an end of itself, because those things pass away. We do it because then it sends us out into the world, able to stand next to the uncomfortable, and do it with grace and love. And when you do go out into the world, and you find yourself in a situation where you are highly uncomfortable with the one you're standing with, the one you're talking to, the situation that you're in. I think we need to ask two things. The first one is, what is God trying to teach me about who my neighbor is right now? Because if you're uncomfortable, that's God's definition of neighbor. And the second thing is, how can I love my neighbor right now? So I invite you, don't be afraid to be uncomfortable. In fact, when you find yourself in the middle of that discomfort, I invite you to look directly in its face. Because I fully believe that the face that will be looking back at you is God's. Will you pray with me? God, we so often try and earn our way into heaven. Earn our way into your grace. And you've told us, you've told us, there is no earning this. You, you can't do enough. You can't be enough. You'll never be perfect enough. But the good news is, you don't have to be. It's freely given. It's grace the love of God for us. And then you told us to turn around and give it away. Well, God, sometimes it's way easier to hold it in than it is to give it away. Help us to open our hearts, open our eyes to the people who you've placed around us, even those who make us uncomfortable, maybe even especially those who make us uncomfortable. Help us to see how you are working in those situations Help us to see how we are bringing grace to those that are around us, but also help us to see how they are bringing you to us as well so that we understand that we are just a part of your grace movement in this world. Help us to be a faithful part of that grace movement in the world. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.